Oops. Uh, no, it'd be the. Uh... Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Can everybody hear me? You guys all hear me? All right. Should be able to hear you guys too. Okay. Those batteries running low. Huh? All right. So, all right. So if this dies, let me know, guys. If you guys can't hear me, like wave your hands or something. <laughs> right. So I can see everybody. Okay. Oh, someone else is in the waiting room. All right, everybody. Welcome to Sales Coffee. Happy Friday. I'm glad everybody's here, right? Um, so today's Sales Coffee, I believe uh, Mr. Vina is going to join us for a little bit as well. I wanted to get things picked off by just going over a few really small basic things that can help us out, you know, number one, be more, be more personable in the meeting and get them to like you a little bit more. And then number two, what I want to go over is a little bit of mindset and um, it kind of selling yourself on what we're doing, right? So one thing that I think it, it, it's tough to do is battle internal, internal objections, right? So everybody's got their own mind, mindset about this business, their own mindset about what, what's successful, what's not successful, right? The only way that you're going to be successful here is if your mind is trained to be successful, right? And, and what I mean by that is making sure that you're able to perform what you, the duties you have to do, your job, with external objections coming in, Right? So things like, you know, uh, you being sick, things like, you know, family issues, stuff with you know, bills, right? All that stuff weighs negatively on your brain, right? So you got to have more positivity than that negative, right? So a lot of it starts with, and we're, you know, usually pretty big on it, mind, body, spirit, right? If you're not waking up every morning and listening to something positive, if you get up every morning and the first thing you do is you go on your social media on your phone, you've already lost the day. If you're starting the day in a negative tone where you're looking at stuff on Facebook or Instagram or things like that, you're already starting your day off on a loss. You need to start your day off with motivation. When you're brushing your teeth, when you're getting your shower, throw on a motivational video. There's one in the group me every single day. Pop that one on, it's 10 minutes, you'll get your motivation for the day, right? And it, it's such a huge mindset shift because you're not starting off negative. Like if you really think about it, guys, when you look at posts on Facebook, I'd say one out of 10 is probably good. Nine out of 10 is people bitching about something. So if you look at that stuff, you're already bringing yourself down, right? So that's the one, one biggest thing that, that I would say it helps me in the morning is getting up every morning and listening to something positive, whether it's um, you know, a podcast from guys like Ed Milet or, you know, uh, motivational speaking from, from, you know, Les Brown or, uh, you know, there, there's thousands of motivational speakers out there, guys. All you have to really do is go to YouTube, type in motivational speaker mindset. And you get 30,000 videos that pop up. They're unlimited. You're never, you're really never going to see the same exact one, you know? So starting your day off with that mindset is a huge, huge advantage because you're going to go through adversity. There's no way to double wrap you and put you in like a, 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 a safe space where you're not going to get harmed by anything. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Little Giants. Right. You know how that little, the little giants, his mom brings him to practice and she bubble wraps them all up. Right. He's all bubble wrapped up like this. He can't even do anything on the field. Right. So she hurt him by bubble wrapping him because he can't do anything. 
That's what I don't want you guys to do. get in your safe space, bubble wrap yourself, because there's no growth in your safe zone. And we're all here to grow, right? We're all here to become a better person today than we were yesterday. So in order to get yourself out of that comfort zone, get yourself out of that bubble, you're going to have to take some risks. You know, you're going to have to make some sacrifices and do some things that you don't feel comfortable doing. Right. Last time I, I did my sales coffee, I went over, you know, the common denominator of success. Right. The common denominator of success is doing things that people who aren't successful don't do. Right. So everybody doesn't want to do something. Right? Everyone doesn't want to make fun. But the most successful people in this get around that. Make it right? It's crazy. Yeah. You're cutting out the battery's done. Uh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, so what I was saying is the common denominator of success and, and, and all these successful people, what they're 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 just willing to do the things that unsuccessful people aren't willing to do. Get up early, make phone calls, right? You know, go in, instead, of, instead of having lunch and sitting around for an hour, going to the gym, getting your body in, in, in shape. Like, it's a really weird thing. People feel, I got them in the middle of the day, they're like, oh man, I'm so tired. I, I worked all morning, right? The, the one thing that helps me a lot get past that is going to the gym and exercising for an hour. Getting your body back up and moving. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to be tired after I work out. No. You're going to be more energy. You're going to have more energy. You're going to be more fired up. Right? It's crazy that I used to think that way too until I've done it. And now I feel great after I work out. I have so much more energy for the rest of the day. So the other big thing about your mentality is your belief level. Guys, you need to believe that what we do really does help people. And it's almost impossible for you not to believe that. Now, some people, it might take processing your first death plan. You're going to get a call one day from one of your clients, and they're going to say, my husband, my brother, my sister, my aunt died yesterday. Can you help? Me? And they're going to be crying. Had it happen many times, guys. That's where my belief level started to change when I first made my first death claim. And it shouldn't have taken that long. It should have been way up at that level before I made that death claim. But you've got to realize, guys, that when you're in the house with these people, you're literally preparing them for the worst situation that they could ever deal with. Their best friend of X amount of years is not there anymore. Right. So they're the one you're the one that they're confiding in at that point. That's why it's so important that you guys believe in what we do and believe in what we do really does help you. Right. One thing that, that usually helps me and my belief level, and I still do it. There's a, a website called lifehappens.org. Go to lifehappens.org, watch a video or two, go to YouTube, type in the importance of life insurance. You'll see a thousand videos of people, how it changed their life in the positive. Or if they didn't have it, how it changed their life in the negative. Right? So, and also want you guys to, to realize that you guys are human beings. This stuff might have happened to you at one point or another. Use that during your presentation. Story sell. Right? Don't go into full crazy detail for 25 minutes about it, right? But you can give someone a five-minute conversation on why this helped you and why you're here, you know? Like, honestly, in, in, my, in my instance, in my situation, my brother passed away two and a, or, or three years ago now. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to help him out with life insurance. His family doesn't have to struggle. You know, his, his wife bought the house that she's in. She actually, you know, Rented it out now. It's used it as a rental property. She lives in another house. 
So she has passive income coming in because of the things that we set up for him, right? So, and, and that, that affected me negatively. That's my brother, right? I still remember getting the phone call. I was at a Dunkin' Donuts in the parking lot, getting coffee on my way out to the field, one o'clock in the afternoon. I got a call from my mom. She told me my brother died. And I said, you're crazy. How? You know, he was the only one of my brothers that didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do, really do anything. Right. He, he passed away because of a brain aneurysm. There's nothing we could have done to prevent it. But at the same time, the crazy thing about the story is two days before that, I was at his, his son's first birthday party. And I had a conversation with him. He remember him telling me that he wanted to cancel some of his life insurance. And I looked at him like he was crazy because he is crazy. Why would you cancel something you already have? All right. So the policy was only enforced for eight months and it paid out. So believe that the people that are in your lead pack, two of them aren't going to be here next. Week. That's the mentality you have to have when you're going through these calls. Yes, I might have called them five times this week. Call them seven times. Call them ten times. You just don't know what their situation looks like. So why you got to call in the morning? Do I have to call in the afternoon? Do I got to call in the evening? There's people in that lead pack that aren't going to answer in the evening because they're working. You got to catch them in the morning before they go to work. That's why 8 a.m. phone calls are great because you're catching people as they're coming out of the door or while they're in their car on their way to work. The average person sits in traffic for about 20 minutes every day. 20 minutes. And if you get them on the phone for five minutes, get the appointment, and they still have 15 minutes to get to work and listen to their radio station, whatever the hell they're listening to. Right? So don't think you're bothering these people in the morning. I want you to realize that. That's one of the big hurdles that I had to jump over when I first got here, is I was like, man, I don't want to call these people at 8 o'clock in the morning and make them mad. You're not going to make them mad, guys. I want you to realize that. They're on their way to work. They're just probably sitting there not doing anything, right? Or they're getting up and they're getting ready for their day because they don't have to work at noon. Or they're getting their kids ready. People are up and about at 8 o'clock in the morning, guys. It's a great time to call. The people that you should call in the morning are typically union members that you haven't got a hold of in a while. Another great one to call in the morning are child safe and will kids. Child safe because the parents are usually up with their kids. And especially in the summertime now, the kids can't sleep in the morning. They're up and about. They're running around the house. The parents are right there too, right? Same thing with, with, with will kids, typically an older generation, right? And at that point, they go to bed early, they wake up early. So they're already up. They've already been up for four hours already, right? So just remember, you're not bothering these people when you're calling them. You're, you're helping them out. That's the mindset you have to do when you're making phone calls. And I don't want you guys to think, oh man, I called this guy four times in the last two days. You're allowed to call him three times a day. Until you call them three times a day on one number, you didn't call them enough. Right? That's the mentality you should have going through this. Because a lot of us are virtual. We can't get out there and go knock on someone's door. That's a big advantage, right? But the other big advantage of being virtual is I don't have to drive 45 minutes out of my way or an hour out of my way and an hour back. So instead of using that 45 minutes of driving, I'm using that 45 minutes to call, right? Even when we were out in the field, when we were, you know, driving to appointments and back and forth, if I knew I had a gap in my schedule of an hour to two hours, I would pull over at like a McDonald's or something like that and I would sit in the parking lot and I would call in my car for two hours. And then I would go door knock. Like you can't get away from the phone calls. It, it's, it, it's impossible. So what you have to do is you have to love them. You have to get better at your craft and then you will, you will love it. Like the one big thing I think with a lot of people is they'll get referrals, they'll collect referrals, and then they'll wait to call those referrals. Why? Why are we waiting to call referrals? They should be called as soon as you get done with that meeting, typically. 
right? Or definitely the next morning when it's fresh, right? And then if you don't get a hold of them for a week, don't just say, oh, I didn't get a hold of them, never call them again. No, call them every single day until, excuse me, until they answer the phone, right? Because chances are the person you sat down with probably is not gonna call them right then and there. They're probably gonna call them tomorrow or text them tomorrow. Right, so they might not even have got a text message yet from them. And then it comes to, to collecting the referrals, getting names on a piece of paper is great, right? You always wanna get names on a piece of paper because you can call. The thing about that is though, is you gotta make sure the person you're sitting down with contacts those referrals. If they don't, your job is so much harder, okay? I want you guys to realize that make your job easier. Roll the referrals in the house, right? And, and there's no secret formula to rolling referrals, it's just asking them to do it. You just have to do it over and over and over again until it becomes a part of your nature, it becomes a part of your presentation, right? So the three things that the most successful agents have here is they're very good on the phones, they're a beast at collecting referrals, Right. And if you knock those two, three, those two out at the first part, the closing process isn't too bad after that. Right. So I want to give you guys a, a few tips for calling like older child safe or older will kids. Right. You might get an objection like, oh man, I filled out for that months ago. I'm not interested in that anymore. Oh, Mary, I understand you filled out that out a couple of months ago, you know, and I apologize for taking so long to get out to you. But the Child Safe program is a very popular program, and we actually ran out of the kits. But the good news is we just got a bunch more delivered, and you're first on the list to get the new kits out. All right, so I can squeeze you in between 2 and 3 o'clock on Wednesday or 3 and 4 o'clock on, on Thursday. Which day works better for you? Even better there, since they've been waiting so long, what you can say is, guys, I do apologize. It took so long to get out to you. But because it took so long, we're actually doing same day meetings. So I have some time a little bit later today between five and six or between eight and nine. Which time works better for you and your spouse? So that time constraint from it being a negative to a positive. They're, you're, they're mad because it took so long to get out to them. All you got to do is tell them, number one, I do apologize for that. Number two, the program is very popular. So there's a lot of people requesting this, right? The good news is we just got a bunch more kits in and they're ready to be delivered. And you're actually one of the first members on the list. Right? It works the same way with little kits. You know, I apologize for taking so long to get out to you, but we do have to go through this individually with every single family. So it took a little bit longer for us to get out to you. The good news is we just got a bunch more kits delivered into the office and they're ready to be ex the, the explained and delivered to everybody. You actually one of the last members we need to catch up with down in the Chicago area. All right, good. Fixed it. I don't know why it does that. All right. So the the other thing I want you guys to, to kind of realize is the only one that's limiting anything that we're doing here is you. Your brain is limiting yourself because the, the main primary goal of your brain is self-preservation, right? The only reason your brain is there is to preserve your body. So if you're going through a time of, you know, I don't want to say like, I mean, if you're going through a bad time, if you're struggling, 
if you're you know not not having the success you want to have, your your brain is going to tell yourself that this isn't good. Don't do this anymore because it's hurting you. Right? That's just your brain protecting you from a negative and it makes a negative feeling, a negative emotion. Right? You have to be mentally strong enough to tell your brain, no, I'm going through this for a reason. Because at the end of the rain, at the end of the light, or at the end of the tunnel, there's a light, right? So what really helps is having a clear vision and a clear goal. Right? I want to define vision though for you guys. Vision should be something that's long term. It should be something that's obtainable. But it's also something that there's no exact formula for right now. Right? So something that is, is very obtainable, something that's long term, and then something that you don't have an exact formula to, to get to right now. So vision is something that's very long term. A goal is, is number one, it's measurable, something that you can track. Number two, it's short term. So month, year, we're not talking five, 10, we're talking month or year, right? Quarter. And then the third time, and then the third thing about a, a, a goal is it has to be specific. You have to be going toward a specific objective. If your goal is to write 10,000 in business, you need to have that measurable factor in there. So how am I going to get there every single week? I'm going to make 1,000 phone calls. I'm going to see 10 people. I'm going to write 2,000, right? And the more specific you are with that goal, the easier the path is to follow. If you just have a goal that says 10,000 ALP, and there's nothing to describe the goal, how are you going to get there? Right? It's like in school, guys, when you did math homework and you just gave the answer, and there's a big spot under the answer for, for how you got that answer, the teacher's going to be like, how did you get the answer? Right? How are you ever going to get the answer if you don't know how to solve the problem? If you can't do the work behind it. So that's one big thing you guys really got to focus on is, yes, the goal's there. I know the goal's there. But what are the small steps along the way that I'm going to take to get to that goal? And then knock off all those small steps. Those are victories. That's going to keep you moving forward. That's why I said obtainable. Right? One thing that used to help me when I was out in the field is I would just focus on sitting down with people. That was the main focus I had. I didn't care about the ALP. I only cared about how many people I sat down with every week because I knew that if I sat down with enough people, I would be able to help enough people. So what I would do, and I know Tommy went over this a little while ago, and this is what I used to do too. We always used to do this. I would get a sticky note and, it, and I'd stick it to the, like the, the dashboard of my car. And on that sticky note, I would have 10 boxes, right? And anytime I got into a sit, I would put an X through that box. And I put an extra that box. So by the end of the week, I knew that I had 10 sits. And every day I got in my car, I had to see them, those empty boxes. So visually representing those presentations to me. Sometimes that's what it takes, guys. It takes a visual representation to see what you need to do. So my suggestion is every single week, either on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard behind you or something like that, make 10 boxes. And mark off those boxes as you get those sets. You guys will be surprised at how much more you are focused at getting sits if there's 10 boxes staring at you every day. All right? And one thing that, that used to help me too is what I would do is every night, like it, Tom's wrote day on this too, and that's why I used to do this. I get, we got to get back to it for sure. Is writing out what you're going to do the next day, the night before. 
so that when you wake up, you have a one day contract. I got to do this, 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 and this. And that's what's going to be successful for the day. All right. On that list, guys, I want you to put these three things on that list. See three clients, set four appointments, and collect 20 referrals. So it should be C4. C4 clients, set four new, new, new appointments, and then collect 20 referrals. Even if you knock out two of those for that day, that's a win. That's a win. If you don't do three sits, but you set four for the next day and you collected 20 referrals in the sit you were in, it's a victory. Because you're setting yourself up for the next day. You're getting the next day better, right? I have um, five, five tips for success, and then I'm going to get into kind of uh, the, like the freedom of choice pitch. That's one thing I made big thing I wanted to go over with you guys today is freedom of choice. Okay. But I got five tips for kind of success before we get into it. All right. The first tip for success is having a clear vision based on obtainable and specific goals. Have a clear vision for the day based on obtainable and specific goals. Number two is being able to stomach adversity. Big dreams equals big adversity. More money, more problems, right? If you guys think that money is gonna solve all your problems, it is not. But money will help you buy time, which will help you solve those problems. Does that make sense, hopefully, to everybody? But you're never gonna to get to that point if you can't get past that adversity. Everybody has adversity, everybody. Whether it's a big thing or a small thing. So death in your family, your car broke down. You're not feeling good, right? It comes down to, are you hurt or are you injured, right? If you're hurt, you can still, you can still probably play. You got a bruise. If you're injured, you broke your leg, you probably can't play, right? It's a different mentality. So are we hurt or are we injured? If we're hurt, there's ways to fix that. It's mindset, right? If you're injured, it's a different story. There might be some internal things there that, that we need to fix first before we can get our mindset where it needs to be at, right? So... I'm a big proponent on getting your mind in the right place, right? I don't know if you guys have seen me in the office and know me, right? I'm very level at all times, never too high, never too low. I go through the same stuff you guys go through, right? But I don't project that out because I don't want that projected toward me. Does that make sense? Whatever you put out in the app, whatever you put out in the universe is going to come back. I'm a big believer in karma, right? So. One of the biggest things that helps me in the morning, it helps me even if I'm having a bad day, is just smile. If you smile more, you're gonna get better results. I'm dead serious about that, like it's crazy. But the, the more you smile, the more it's gonna help other people and the more it's gonna affect other people. And you're gonna feel good about yourself too. Right? It's, it's something very, very small that people take for granted is a smile. Now, of course, we all just went through COVID. We couldn't even tell if someone was smiling through the mask or not, right? But when you're on a meeting with somebody, you always want to show up with a big smile on your face and be excited to meet them because you're, you're putting that energy into the atmosphere and it's going to come right back to you from them smiling and them being engaged, right? Number three, know why you're doing it and what you're doing it for, having a purpose. If my purpose for the day is to sit down with four members, I know what the purpose is. I know why I'm doing it because I'm gonna help their family. It's easier to get up every day and do that, right? Now, when you get into leadership, it's a different shift. Your purpose is to better other people, right? So I wake up every morning now, 
with a, a renewed purpose every single morning because I know that there's somebody in this agency that's going to need help today that I can help them out with. The adversity that I've gone through in my life is only going to be a positive in their life because I've already gone through it, right? So what I'm getting at there, everybody here, is your managers and your supervisors have been through a lot of things. They've probably been through something that you're going through right now. Talk to them about this stuff, right? Don't be afraid to come to your manager and say, hey, I'm going through this, this, and this. Is there any advice to help me out about that? Guys, we're, all, of our, all, all of the MGAs and all the managers here, they're going to help you whether you're on their team or not. My door is always open. If my door is open and you need help, come on in. I'll help you out. Right? And as an agency, I don't care whose team they're on. I don't care who's making money off of them. It doesn't matter to me. Because I'm here to make sure everybody in this agency succeeds. Everybody wins. We're all on one team. Right? And the more that we're a big group together, the harder it is to break that group up. But when groups are spread out, this team's over here, this team's over here, this team's over here, it's a little bit more difficult to all come together as one, right? So making sure you know what you're doing, being specific and intensive and, and attentive with what you're doing. So if you're, if you're gonna, what I mean by that is if you have five appointments for the day, you have an appointment at two, three, and then you don't have anything till six, seven, eight, nine. Well, you have a gap in there of, of an hour. The gap needs to be a specific time to do something. Mark it down in your schedule so that when that time comes, you're not like, oh, I have an hour. What am I going to do? No, you know what you're going to do. You're going to go get lunch. You're going to go to the gym. Or you're going to make phone calls to set up more appointments for the day. Now, the, one of the toughest things to do is after you get no-showed, is to get on the phone and make more phone calls. It's a tough mental, mental thing to do. It really is. It's not easy. But you just have to realize that the reason I'm, I'm making those calls is you're, you're, you should be punishing yourself almost. That's what I think about. When I get no-showed, I'm punishing myself to say, Drew, they didn't show up for a reason. Got to get back on the phone to get more set. Right? So I want you guys to, to take it personally when someone no-shows you. You can't just be like, oh, man, they, they know showed me. They must have something going on. No, it's what, what, what could I have done better to get them on the meeting with me? Okay. Number four, four tips for success. People that are most successful don't require immediate results. They trust the process. So not requiring immediate results. Right? Think about, and Tony went over this in, in the meeting. Think about the bamboo tree. Right? It doesn't grow for three years or something like that. And then after that, it grows to be one of the tallest plants out there. The tallest, strongest. Right? Because it spent all of that time growing downward to build a big base so it could grow upward. Right? Your base should be your scripts. They should be your phone scripts, your, your presentation scripts, right? All that stuff is your base. The more that you learn about that, the better you have that down, the better the presentation is going to be. Right? And then the, the fifth tip is making sacrifices when sacrifices are needed to be made. And I'm not talking about sacrificing, you know, your, your son's birthday party. I'm talking about sacrificing the time before and after your son's birthday party, right? I'm not talking about, you know, you having a trip planned and you have to cancel that trip because you got to do something here. No, plan that out in your schedule. So that way, you know, oh, if I go away over the weekend, I need to, to, to ramp it up Monday through Friday so that I can take that weekend off. Plan for that in advance, right? Let's try to get it here tighter. So understand that you need to make certain sacrifices to be successful here. 
Now, just know that those sacrifices are going to pay off. They're not going to be forever. Right? I've sacrificed the last five years to build my renewals to where they're at right now. People call renewals funny money. I don't think it's funny because I work very hard for those renewals. They're not funny to me. Right? But I understand where that came from. I understand that I worked very hard and diligently over the last four years to get to where I'm at right now. And it wasn't easy. I went through a lot of struggles, guys. I've lost more than you guys have ever tried. So that's why I'm saying every, every MGA, every manager here has lost a lot. We failed, right? But we failed forward. I'm still here. It's going to take a lot more than someone no showing me or someone canceling a policy for me to, to give up this opportunity. Because, guys, I've done a lot more for a lot less. And I'm sure some of you have too. Right? But making the sacrifice should be an easy thing because you're not sacrificing for somebody else. You're sacrificing for you. You guys realize that? Like, you're not working for somebody else. You're working for you. This is your business. Treat it as such. I was a business owner before. I had a painting company. I pay, I pay three full-time employees every single week. All right? There were people relying on me. I needed to get up and go. No, there's no one really relying on me. It's me, right? How mentally strong are you to push yourself forward when you don't have someone that has to rely on you? Then if that's the case, make up somebody. Make up your future family, right? When Tommy Vina was sacrificing, he didn't have a wife or kids. He knew one day he would have that, though, so he busted his ass for 10 years so that his family is set up now, right? He had the vision to forecast, I'm going to have a wife and two kids one day. And he made it happen. But it, never ha it would never happen unless you actually vision casted that. Right? Everything, everything is created twice. Once in your brain and then once in reality. Try to create things twice. Right? All right. So the last thing on time, 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 time. We got 20 more minutes. All right. So last thing I wanted to go over is the freedom of choice certificate, guys. All right? This is the most unique thing about our company. Number, well, it's the second most. The first the most unique thing is that we're a union-based life insurance company, right? We're the only one that exists. But the second unique thing about our company is this freedom of choice certificate that nobody else has. Nobody's got this, right? So this is the solution to a lot of their problems. So when you're going over the freedom of choice certificate, oh, shit, <laughs> there's, a, there's three steps you have to take. Right. The three steps are to number one, pin the cost of the funeral on somebody. It's typically the spouse. They don't have a spouse. It's the mother, the father, the brother, the sister. Pin the cost on somebody else. Right. Make it real. The second thing you need to do is not cause a problem not causing it, right? We're just opening up their eyes to the problem that's already there. We're re revealing the problem, right? The problem is that number one, funeral directors weren't paid that day. Number two, there's no set prices for a funeral. If you ever walk into a funeral home, there's no McDonald's menu board that says, Cremations this much, funerals this much, right? They base it off of what they see, right? So if, if Mary walks in there and she says, my husband Joe passed away, he had $50,000 in life insurance, what can I get for a funeral? Well, what do you think the funeral director's gonna say? Probably $49.99 plus tax, right? 
and they'll be dragging that person up and down the street with white Clydesdales and fireworks shooting off everywhere and gold caskets, right? Even though they didn't want that stuff. So, and that happens a lot, guys, because people don't understand the process of a funeral. What they typically do is they'll walk in there with their life insurance policy, and the funeral director, director is going to ask them two questions. They're going to ask them, did your loved one have life insurance? And of course, they're going to they're say yes. And then the second question they ask is how much? How much life insurance did they have? And if that person tells that funeral director how much they have, the funeral director is going to use that to his advantage. And why we created our freedom of choice certificate. Because on the back, there's no amount. There's a spot for an amount, but there's no amount on there. So the beneficiary knows how much they have. Our company knows how much they have. The funeral director does not. Right? It's like playing poker and you have all the cards and the dealer, and then the dealer who the, is a funeral director has not. You're going to win every time because you have all the cards. Right? It makes the process of negotiating for a funeral so much easier it really does you got to just remember the mentality of somebody that's going into that process they just lost their best friend of x amount of years they're not thinking straight what most people do in that in that, in that position is they tend to throw money at problems to get them to go away it's what a lot of people do there's a problem money is a solution here's money right so this is kind of the only situation where they should not do that because yes, this money is designed to protect the funeral, but it's also designed to go back to the family as well and take care of what they have to take care of there. Right? So showing them the problem. The problem is that funeral directors want paid that day and that there's no set price for a funeral or a funeral home. Those are the two biggest problems. Right? And then the solution. The third thing of the three, uh, three steps is show them the solution. Bring them the solution, right? The more personable you make this freedom of choice certificate, the more that people are going to respond to it and like it. Because this is very unique, right? Most of the time what has to happen is they'll take this certificate, or if they don't have our company, what they'll do is they'll bring their life insurance policy in there. And the funeral director will say, let me see that life insurance policy. And he'll open it up to the first page and he can see how much he's going to take right there on the bottom, right? Then he'll say, it'll be $30,000 for this funeral. And you'll say, okay, great. Then that person has to write a check out for $30,000 out of their bank account and give it to that funeral director. So now they have to wait for the claim to be processed. They have to call the company they have to make the claim. They have to wait four to six weeks for that money to come back in. In that four to six weeks, the fifteen or 30000 they pay for that funeral, that's a huge burden on the family. They might have to borrow that from 10 people. Nobody's got fifteen dollars to $30,000 lying in their bank account. And if you do, it's not for a funeral. They were using that for something else. Right? So I'm going to kind of give you guys my freedom of choice pitch and then use, it, use, use, use what you want out of it, right? But what I typically say is I say, now, Mary and Joe, this is your freedom. This is your freedom of choice certificate. So first off, I'm always giving them ownership of it before they own it. I say, Mary and Joe, this is your freedom of choice certificate. So the way that it works is that Joe, God forbid, you don't come home from work tomorrow, who's gonna to be in charge of your final arrangements? Ask them that question. Joe, if you don't come home from work tomorrow, who's gonna to be in charge of your final arrangements? Say, uh, Mary, of course. Mary, okay. Mary, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this certificate into the funeral home, Mary, and you can see on the bottom here, it says go to any funeral home, any one you wanted to go to. And what you're going to do, Mary, is you're going to walk in there and you're going to say, my husband had life insurance. He wants this, this, and this done with the funeral. How much is that going to cost? 
and then she can negotiate back and forth, right? And usually I say, Mary, you look like a pretty good negotiator, right? So let's just say that Joe had 30,000 of whole life insurance in force and you're a good negotiator. So you were able to get the cost of the funeral down to 15,000. So what you would do is you would put $15,000 on the back here. You would sign it at the bottom. You hand this and the proof of death forms over to the funeral director. And everything from that point on is taken care of for you. So Mary, you're going to use that next three to five days to greet, to start the funeral process, to call the family, to get everybody together. That next three to five days is very hectic. The last thing you want to worry about is where money is coming from to take care of that funeral, right? But the good news is, Mary, once, that you, once you give this certificate over to the funeral director, the funeral director, what he's gonna do is because he wants paid that day, he's gonna call the 1-800 number on the bottom here. And he's gonna talk directly to our claim department. Once he talks to our claim department, right then and there, that's when a claim starts. Right then and there. So the funeral director calls that 1-800 number, talks to our claim department. Our claim department does two things there, guys. They, number one, make sure that the price that you negotiated on the back is a fair market value and that you don't get taken advantage of. The second thing that they do is they send out two checks immediately. One check for the $15,000 that it costs for the funeral is going to go directly to the funeral director. So he's not knocking on your door in 10 days, 20 days, asking for that money. And then the second check gets sent right back to the beneficiary in a tax-free lump sum payment three to five days later to wrap up any of the costs, right? And then at the end, I tie them down. I say, Mary and Joe, can you see why this was created for all of our members? And they'll say, yes. I say, Mary and Joe, do you see how easy it is for claims to be made with this freedom of choice certificate. Yes. Mary and John, do you have any questions on how your freedom of choice certificate works? Giving them ownership of it, right? Typically they'll say no if you explain it the right way. And a lot of the times they're gonna be like, oh my God, that's great. You mean I don't have to call the company and make a claim or no, you don't have to do any of that. The claim is starting, the claim process is already starting once they give this in the proof of death form over to the funeral director. It's already starting, right? Another reason why it's important is because if you don't have life insurance and you have to pay for a funeral, the funeral director won't start that process until he gets half of what the funeral costs. He's not going to do anything until he gets half of what the funeral costs. Typically, they want half up front and then half within 90, 60 to 90 days. If they don't get that half after those 60 days, they can legally charge you up to 20% interest on that. So a lot of money on $10,000, right? That's where people come into a buying that is they don't have the money right then and there because it's a right then and there cost. You can't have a body sit there for months. It, 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 it's impossible, right? And I've heard a lot of times, sitting down with a lot of members over the last five years, I've heard stories of people like, yeah, you know, he didn't have any life insurance. He wanted Barry, but we couldn't afford it. So we had to cremate him, right? I want you guys to realize this too about cremations. If you don't have money for a cremation, and that you're going the cheapest route, you're not getting cremated by yourself. There's a couple other people that are going in that kiln with you too. So are you really getting ashes from your loved one or are you getting ashes from everybody that's in that kiln with you? It's a sad thing, but that's how it works. I, um, but, that's kind of, kind of how I pitch my freedom of choice certificate, giving them ownership of it, explaining how it works in very detail, and explaining what most people actually do in that situation, and telling them we don't want you to be most people, we want you to be a part of the company that makes it very easy for you guys. Right? So even if they have term life insurance, 
They don't have whole life to take care of their funeral. They don't have the freedom of choice certificate. Right? And until they get this, they're not properly protected. That should be your mindset. If they don't have this freedom of choice certificate, they're not properly protected. All right. So I got a couple more minutes before I have to hop off here. Anybody have any questions for me about anything? We're going to open it up. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Any questions, guys? Yeah, can you go over real quick, kind of just going off of Andreas's uh, or Angel's question earlier? Um, what are some ways that you know you can tell us um, how to get them to, or how to make the presentation more conversational throughout it? Okay. Good. Good. Yes. So to make it more conversational, it starts with rapport in the beginning. Um, you, there's a fine line between being their friend and being an advisor. You got to walk that fine line. You want to be friendly with them in the beginning. You want them to get them to like you, right? But you don't want to get into the point where they're your best friend and they're talking about things that don't matter. You, you kind of want to steer the conversation to things that do matter, right? And opening them up to conversation, getting them to talk about what they do for work getting them to talk about their family, these important things that we're going to use down the road, right? So to make things more conversational with them, a lot of the time it comes during the needs analysis when you're breaking down their coverage, right? There's a lot of questions back and forth there you got to ask them. You know, the one thing you really got to focus on in that, in that situation is showing them a situation where one family member of the family is not there anymore and asking them how it would affect them. Right. That's a good way to get them to open up more is just asking them, how would that affect you? Because it's not a one word answer there. They got to explain themselves a little bit. Right. Another good way to, to lead the conversation, Matt, is to use active listening. Right? When you ask them a question and they answer the question, use the last four or five words that they said and to start your next question. Some of the things that usually help me when I'm sitting down with the members is kind of putting myself in what they like to do for fun as well, right? Putting myself into their situation. So if they're like, oh, man, we got a huge family. I, I grew up in a really big family, too. Are you guys in the middle? Or are you at the end? You know, you firstborn. Right, asking small things like that so you can figure out how big their family is and where they're at in their family tree. Then when they tell you, oh, I did this for work, this for work, and this for work. You know, oh, I, I used to do something very similar to that. We did this, this, and this. Right? Did you ever think about getting into that? Or what made you get into, you know, the uh, the, the railroad, railroad workers? What, what made you get into the Teamsters? Right? Figuring out where the decision came from. Trying to think of like other small small areas where you can where you can add stuff into their anticipated joy. Anticipated joy. What are they looking forward to? There you go. Yeah. Um, when you're dealing with POS guys, if you're sitting down with policy orders, one of the first questions I ask them is, "What you're looking to get out of this meeting today?" I think one thing that that helps a lot with me specifically, is I'm very transparent. I don't beat around the bush with anything. I'm very intentional with the words I say because I don't have time to sit down with a person for four hours. You know, I'm very intentional with my words. I'm very intentional about how the presentation goes, right? And it should be rapport, no cost, making yourself the expert, showing them about life insurance, and then walking them through the additional benefits, right? You can see that organization, and I know everyone has the same style going through, not everyone has the same style going through everything, but the formula should be the same every time, right? Just throw a little bit of yourself in there too. Um, but Matt, it's, it's more or less, making sure that when you're talking to them about rapport and when you're building rapport with them, that you do it intentionally and about things that you need to know about what they yeah. do for work, yeah. you know, what, 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 what their family looks like, 
The biggest thing is what they like to do for fun. I'm honestly telling you guys, if you do not ask them what they're doing for fun, what they're doing outside of the family or with the family for fun, you're losing. Because most of the time, they're going to tell you that, that they do something for fun. And guess what, guys? Fun costs money. Fun costs money most of the time. So if you're spending money on fun, you can use a little bit of that fun money to pay for something that's important, like life insurance. Because if Joe's not here anymore, the family can use, still use that money to go still have some fun. And in fact, they're going to want to have a little bit more fun to get the memory of Joe off the top of their brain. All right? Hopefully that helped a little bit, Matt. Yeah, for sure. If no one else has a question, you've got a question. Yeah, actually, I do. Um, we talked a lot about that mind, body, and spirit. Can you hear me okay? I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, I know we talked a little bit about the mind, body, and spirit. And so um, this is the question I've kind of been thinking about personally. So I wanted to ask, um, what do you feel is one major thing that we as individuals should be focused on improving every day, whether we're leaders or whether we're just producers and agents? What do you think is one big thing that we should be solely focused on improving every day? You should be so you should be focused on improving your mindset every day. Your 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 positivity, putting positivity out into the world, making the next day better. As long as you can make focus today on making the next day better, you're going to be in a good spot. You're going to get better every day, right? And I'm glad you brought that up because I actually had this written down. Uh, one thing that used to help me when I was a new agent is just looking at the materials over and over and over again. Like I would go to keyforsuccess.com or Arius University every day and watch a video on something. Watch a 10, 20 minute video to get better, right? And then one of the biggest things, Sydney, and I would recommend everybody doing this, at the end of the day, ask, ask one question to your manager about something that can get you further. Anything that's like bothering you that day or anything that went wrong that day, call your manager at the end of the night and say, hey, this went wrong. Is there something I can do to fix that so it doesn't go wrong tomorrow? Um, in, in, short, in a short answer, Sydney, it's your mentality because that's what's going to push you through the hard times. That's what's going to make sure that when you do have a bad day, that the next day is better. Right. And not everybody has the same skill level. Right. But everybody can have the same mental positivity level. That's an easy thing to do. That's something you can control. Right. The, the, you know, the three things you can control are attitude, effort and being coachable. Those are the three things you can control every day. Right. Just wake up with that on your mind. I'm going to be the, you know, the best positive person. My mindset's going to be, you know, the, the most positive, and I'm going to do everything that, that I was told to do today in, in the best way I can do it. Right. And the one big thing, too, Sydney, is I don't want you to beat yourself up over something you have no control over. Like, there's a lot of the times when new agents will make phone calls. I made 250 phone calls, and only three people answered me. You can't control that. You can't control them picking up the phone. Short of walking to their house and waiting outside their door and calling them right there and looking at them through the window, answer your phone. That's about the only thing you can do, right? But other than that, you just got to make sure that you're mentally strong enough to know that maybe it didn't happen today, but I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to do the same thing and we're going to get better results, right? Thinking you're going to do the same thing and get the same results, that's a weak mindset. You're never going to get anywhere with that negative mindset, right? So you just have to believe that the next day is going to be better. All right. Very good question, Sydney. Very good question. Anybody else? I know Matt, you got another one, right? Um, just just real briefly, I was kind of going back to the POS. Um, because you know, when when you told me, ask them up front what what do they want to get most out of today's meeting. Um, I feel like I feel like it kind of could be a point if you could lose control. Um, at that point, because obviously, you know, we, we know what we're there to do. Um, we want to give them the best customer service, but if they're like, I just want to know what I have, I don't want to, I don't want to get anything more. They're going to say that every time, Matt. 
You know why? Because they're buyers. Because they're sold already. They're going to tell you that they don't want to buy anything because they're going to buy it. Right. right? Yeah. The reason why I asked that question, though, is because I want them to feel that this is individualized to them and that we don't do this every single, like, I want them to feel that I'm specifically working with them to make sure that their family is better off. Right. I'm not just a policy manager going through everyone's policy, getting them more life insurance. I'm there to make sure that what they have is good for them and then showing them options to make them in a better situation down the road. All right. So I want to figure out what they want to get out of the meeting because I've said that before, Matt, and people are like, yeah, you know, I was actually thinking about getting more life insurance. At that point, it's like, okay, great. You know, I don't know if you'll be able to qualify, but we'll see what we can do at the end here. So it works both ways, Matt. You know what I mean? But you're never going to get, most of the time when I ask that question, most people are like, I just want to understand what I have. I want to know how much life insurance I have. And you're going to be like, okay, great. We're definitely going to get to that. We're definitely going to make sure you understand that 100%. But before we get into that, they got a bunch of no-cost benefits that I have to go over with you and just run your presentation, right? Don't ever, if they're like, yeah, I want to know how much life insurance I have. Don't ever just go right into the life insurance right then and there. You lost all control. That's when you lose control. I'm steering the conversation and I'm steering the presentation in a way that, number one, looks like I'm, I'm taking care of their concerns, but I'm still doing my normal presentation. I'm not changing it up because of what they said right there. I'm just gathering a little bit more information. That's all. Does that make sense, Matt? All right, cool. Anybody gather, anybody else got any other questions? Quick, quick nope. question. Um, so when you're asking, when you're asking, sorry, when you're asking sorry. about the uh, what do you want um, from this meeting, are you asking that during rapport building, or are you asking that after rapport building once you've gone through the company and stuff like that? I usually, I usually ask that right after I get done with the two part program. You know, so it's two parts. First part's all the no cost benefits for you. Second part, we're going to go over your current life insurance and show you how all that works. And then run That's another the analysis. Yeah, basically. I would say, you know, the reason, you know, yeah, I would put it right in there, you know. So before we actually get into all that, you know, I always ask everybody, you know, all of our policy orders, you know, the, the same question, you know, what do you want to get out of this meeting? Or what's the biggest thing you want to achieve with sitting down with them today? Which is that so strictly just for policy holders or would you do that for like unions and I would just do it for policy holders. Okay. Thanks. You have to remember like a policy holder, a POS presentation, you should build more rapport with them because they already trust the company. They're already members with the company. You don't have to sell the company. You got to sell yourself on who you are and why you're there. And then you basically have to spend a lot more time on breaking down their coverage and, and their needs analysis, right? So the no cost should be a little bit quicker. I'm not saying fly through to get no referrals, right? But all I'm saying is the meat and, the, the meat and potatoes of why we're with the POS is a, about their, a, their current coverage. Does that make sense? All right. Um, Got it, thank you. Right. Yeah, no problem. I thought Tommy was gonna hop on for a bit, but I guess not. Um, oh, well. Anybody else got any other questions? <laughs> no? Okay. All right, guys. Well, hopefully you guys can use some of this stuff today. Get better every single day. Let's go out and have some fun this weekend. Protect some families. Um, this weekend's going to be kind of weird weather-wise, so a lot of people might still be in their homes. It's going to rain a little bit over the weekend. So use that to our advantage, guys. People are going to be home. They're going to be bored. All right, they've already watched all the TV they're going to watch. Get them, get them on Gina TV. Get them on Matt James TV, right? Uh, just, just be more entertaining than the TV screen they're watching, and you're going to have success. That's what it breaks down to with virtual. You've got to be more entertaining than what they have on their screens. Right? If, they're more, if you're more entertaining, they're going to pay attention to you. Typically, when people pay attention to you, they understand the benefits, and they enroll. And a lot of the time when they don't understand what it's going to do for them, they're like, oh, I don't need it or I want to think about it. Right? So, guys, thank you for hanging out with me today. Um, it's kind of a uh, 
kind of thrown into this, you know, really quickly, but I'm glad uh, we were able to get you guys some good information and you guys asked good questions. So um, other than that, you guys all have my phone number. If you need me, shoot me a text, a call. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to you guys. All right. Let's go, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. That was fire. Let's go, Drew. Off the rip, too.